Hi class, welcome to History 118. Uh, welcome to Chapter 16, Reconstruction, the first in a long line of lectures that is going to span from um, right after the Civil War is completed and we're trying to heal the nation under Reconstruction all the way up till the present day. Uh, what is going to happen with uh, the Obama administration, the Trump admins, um, and everything of the sort. So um, it is hopefully going to be a good uh, lecture. So uh, hold on, sit tight, and uh, hopefully you like it. But to start off Reconstruction, uh, the period of time when the nation is trying to heal itself after the Civil War, after we've had so many bloody uh, deaths, 600,000 plus um, Americans on U.S. soil, uh, the nation is trying to consider how to heal itself, right? Um, because it was fractured for so long. And um, some questions for us to consider as we're going through uh, you know, class today, right, or lecture, is what is the meaning of freedom? Is it uniform for every single individual or uh, perhaps different? Uh, some might, you know, perceive freedom uh, one way and others perceive freedom another. So we'll, we'll kind of have a friendly chat about that. Uh, did the African-American communities in the South experience meaningful freedom after their emancipation? So once everyone was officially emancipated or freed, quote unquote, uh, was that the end all be all, uh, you know, solution or not? What setbacks did they experience? Uh, so we'll go through some of those as well. Um, explaining how the federal government implemented various policies to help Reconstruction and African Americans and how the South reacted. So Reconstruction is an interesting moment of U.S. history, uh, similar uh, eras that we've had since then as well, but the federal government attempted from a very top-down uh, way to implement emancipation, uh, incorporate African Americans into the fold, um, away from uh, their enslaved past towards becoming equals, right, U.S. citizens, slowly but surely, and of course the South and the various Southern governments were going to react uh, poorly and react in another way. And so we'll see what that dynamic push and pull is going to be. Uh, and finally, how would you define freedom today? Do you feel that people have limited freedoms now in some way, shape, or form? So I like to ask this towards the end because in our discussion of freedom and slavery and emancipation and reconstruction and all of that, uh, it seems that modernly we have slowly or somehow become slaves to our own uh, demise in some way, shape, or form. Uh, perhaps you feel that you're working 40, 50, 60 hours a week and you have no free time to yourself, in which case you might consider uh, the corporate structure of capitalism, right? Um, enslaving you, your body and mind and your soul. Um, others, perhaps uh, if you are within the 18, 22, 23 age range of my usual college students, um, perhaps, I don't know, your parents want you to uh, go through a certain type of major or career. Right. Maybe they're telling you you have to be a doctor or a lawyer. Um, and then, I don't know, maybe your heart sings for English literature. Right. Uh, something along those lines. Um, do you have freedom within, I don't know, love. Right. So many various types. Uh, so we can kind of go through that um, and have a nice wrap up discussion. But let's get into post Civil War. So by the end of the Civil War between the North's Union and the South's Confederacy, right? The Confederacy is uh, in the news immensely right now, especially with the statues um, due to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and I will post up um, a short freehand kind of uh, video, um, either tonight or tomorrow, uh, detailing, you know, uh, some major kind of things in the news right now. And so that'll definitely be among them. Uh, but between the North's Union and South's Confederacy, um, at the very end of it, uh, various leaders within the African-American community sat down with General Sherman. Uh, General Sherman was one of the major uh, generals of the North uh, who was responsible for hammering his way through the South um, under the Union banner and uh, claiming a victory for the North. Uh, so most people at the very end of the, uh, of the war um, always remember uh, General Ulysses S. Grant, who ended up being one of our presidents, and he's on the $50 bill. Uh, but General Sherman was also uh, a very instrumental part of that as well. And so he sat down with some of the African-American community leaders and, uh, you know, was wanted to discuss with them what they understood as freedom and what they wanted for them, their community members. 
And so uh, by uh, having a conversation about slavery, uh, they ended up indicating that receiving by irresponsible power or irresistible uh, power the work of another man and not by his consent. Whereas to them, freedom was placing us where we can reap the fruit of our own labor and take care of ourselves. And so they do not want their work to just get sucked up and absorbed for the betterment and pleasure of another, right? As most of us do. Um, and so hopefully we can relate on that on many deep levels. And the road to reconstruction began here, right? As soon as the war closed, uh, reconstruction began. But what was it? Uh, it's pretty much in the name, but they tried to reconstruct the, the nation, right? They tried to heal it between the north and the south. And uh, it was a very difficult situation because reconstruction was led by President Andrew Johnson and not by Lincoln because, surprise, surprise, he was assassinated by um, John Wilkes Booth in a theater box office when he was looking at um, some entertainment. And so... Lincoln, unfortunately, did not see the fruits of his labor accomplished and completed to its fullest extent uh, and to see the African-American community kind of brought into the fold um, of American society. And so his vice president, Andrew Johnson, upon Lincoln's uh, death and assassination, got elevated into the presidency, as one does because there is a various chain of command, right? And so there were various, you know, foundational ideals that you know, the constitutional writers uh, were envisioning. Uh, and, you know, the Constitution uh, didn't, at that point in time, did not actively reflect uh, what the United States needed. Because the original founders, when they wrote the Constitution, slavery was alive and well. And so a couple hundred years later, that it, you know, they could not foresee uh, that, you know, slavery was going to be abolished and the life would be completely different. And so it had to be rewritten uh, with amendments to include African Americans, guaranteeing citizenry, equality before the law, the right to vote, interracial democracy, etc. Um, and so that was the original uh, idealistic goal, right? As soon as the African Americans were emancipated, um, to rewrite the Constitution and guarantee all of these rights. Unfortunately, uh, the Reconstruction did not happen as smoothly or easily as some had hoped. And so many of these ideals fell short and would take uh, decades after this moment in time to uh, give them all of these said um, rights and equalities. Um, and so in real life, the South faced many tumultuous years uh, after the Reconstruction proposals. And the U.S. still deals with racism today, obviously, right, as we're seeing um, Black Lives Matter movement take things into their own hands uh, and rise up against uh, injustice and inequality that they are seeing within society and police forces. And so here is uh, Abraham Lincoln and Mr. Booth within the booth, uh, you know, at the very famous kind of uh, four theater. And uh, Lincoln, like I said before, unfortunately, didn't could not live enough to see uh, the fruits of all of his labor from the Civil War, uh, the emancipation and such uh, actually come to fruition. And the Civil War itself was immensely bloody. Uh, it was, you know, American versus American. Uh, we had approximately 600 plus thousand troops die. Uh, the single greatest, bloodiest war of U.S. history to date. And it left both sides scarred. But because the South uh, were defeated, uh, the Confederacy was defeated, um, it was left, the entire region of the South ended up being in shambles. And so we see, you know, photographs like this of railroads just absolutely destroyed and demolished, um, you know, cities in ruin. Um, and so, you know, much of the economy and the lifestyle within the South was not what what they originally uh, envisioned would occur, right? In a, in a kind of pro-slavery confederacy, right? They're... Uh, ideals of maintaining the slavery status quo, right, and fighting the war, uh, ended up in uh, ended up in defeat, and they were uh, obviously put under the uh, guiding rule of the North, so to speak. Uh, but even all the way till today, 
some folks are still waving the Confederate flag around uh, in the South. Uh, and so there's this kind of, you know, yeehaw dream of the South will rise again, right? And it's kind of local history. Um, but, you know, history has, you know, weighed and measured the Confederacy. And it is, from my perspective, at least, you can disagree with me, of course, but from my perspective, the Confederacy were rebels. They were traitors. Um, they rebelled against the nation. Um, and one half of the nation fought a war, uh, and so they were summarily defeated. Um, otherwise, things probably would have gone into a completely different direction if the Confederacy would have won. Now, uh, in 65, right when the war ended, Congressman James Garfield asked the nation, what is freedom? And it opened up a whole series of debates and discussions. Uh, to What does freedom mean? Does it mean not to be physically chained? Uh, is it the having the absence of slavery? Uh, is freedom having more rights than slaves? Equal civil rights, right, right to vote, ownership of property, equality under the law, etc. Henry Adams, an, an emancipated slave himself, uh, stated very eloquently that uh, to his former master when he spoke, if I cannot do like a white man, I am not free. And so that was a very poignant understanding that in the United States at that point in time, specifically, um, white men had all of the power and privilege over their African-American uh, brethren, if you will, the, their countrymen. And so he said, if I can't have the same rights as the white man, then that's not freedom at all. Then I am still considered a second class citizen to some extent. Uh, and so what is the definition of freedom in general? It is the power or right to act, speak or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. And so I would ask you to define freedom in your own lives today, because we can use all of these historical narratives and try to intertwine them with our own life. Um, do you want more freedom of time? Do you have no time to yourself whatsoever because you have work, family obligations, and you can't have five minutes to breathe? Uh, do you want more freedom of choice? Do you feel like some choices in your life are being snuffed out? Or freedom of love? Or perhaps freedom of finance? Do you dream of a life where money is no no longer an issue and you can freely buy and spend what your heart desires? Uh, perhaps freedom of career, if your parents are forcing you into a career uh, that you do not necessarily agree with. Um, or freedom of worry, perhaps you are so stressed that you are grinding your teeth at night and you just, oh, you just, you can't uh, go through life, um, you know, properly without worry. So perhaps that is what freedom means to you. It's individual to us all. But at least as a collective, as a society, we can agree that various freedoms, such as slavery and bondage, um, that is uh, equal across the board. We can kind of agree on that. And so post-emancipation life, many African-American family dynamics, uh, you know, saw some changes. Uh, they were still heavy into worshiping in, within churches. Uh, schools were detaching themselves from white ownership or control. And so the black community uh, definitely attempted to rebuild the physical and psychological effects of slavery. Because if you can imagine generation after generation, families being put on the auction block, and you and your entire family are split up to different plantations to work, uh, the family unit is destroyed. And so uh, years of having the family unit, the nuclear family dynamic disintegrated, uh, left a deep scar in the community. And so as soon as emancipation uh, and reconstruction began, uh, they began to try to rebuild all of this. Uh, and so as they were rebuilding their uh, own familial institutions, uh, they were branching off into church institutions, into uh, political institutions, uh, and also to gain meaningful employment because you need to work uh, in order to provide for the family that you are trying to rebuild, right? Uh, the church played a central role in the community as it still does today. Um, arguably, worship was the one major thing that got African Americans through the horrendous years of slavery. Uh, you know, having uh, a higher power at your side, belief in God, belief in heaven, and that all of the struggle might one day somehow be worth it, um, it plays a powerful role. A very pivotal role. Um, political freedom. Uh, voting rights became a central issue for the community. 
um, after the South surrendered, right, in, at the end of the Civil War. Uh, Frederick Douglass himself, an escaped slave, social reformer himself, an abolitionist and orator, uh, himself stated about voting rights that slavery is not abolished until the black man has the ballot. And so that's a very uh, unique uh, in you know viewpoint right of U.S. politics and where power truly lies, and so even today in the modern day, um, things that we're seeing in, I believe it was in recent news from a week ago, Georgia, uh, the lines to vote in Georgia because of the COVID nineteen situation are just stretching for hours and hours. I keep reading on certain uh, social media sites and Reddit that some folks are standing in line for six seven hours to vote, and so once the freedom to vote uh, becomes more and more out of your grasp or reach that disenfranchises your own community and so you have less of a powerful voice in uh, voting and where the country ultimately is going to uh, you know steer towards and so that's a very very point in point uh, Frederick Douglass himself was an immense uh, character so fascinating if you can ever pick up um, one of his biographies, I definitely recommend it. He was uh, an enslaved person himself, and he escaped, went to the north, and began to um, uh, educate himself, threw himself into schools. And so one day, um, at the ripe age, at the turn of um, at the turn of his life, uh, approximately, if I remember correctly, he was around 20 years old or so, um, in university, right, just uh, just trying to uh, get out and finish his work. And he famously was giving a lecture to uh, his colleagues and the uh, ranking professor, right? The Emirate professor was standing there, right? And kind of listening to his speech and his work. And although Frederick Doug Douglass was initially nervous, right? As any young man would be, uh, he finished uh, all of you know his thoughts. And so the Emirate professor came up and raised his hand and said, do we have here chattel or a man? And chattel famously is the word used for an object, for property. You're not a human being, you are uh, merely an object of property. And so everyone unanimously uh, said a man. And so his fruitful career was born. Uh, and so since then, he spent decades uh, going across the country in tours and giving intellectual speeches, uh, giving intellectual critiques of what was going on in the United States at the time. And uh, he ended up being the uh, shining example of what African Americans could be in the United States given the equal and right circumstances. And the South hated him, right? Because the South wants to propagate the myth and the idea that all uh, Negroes at this time were lazy, they were uneducated, uh, why give them rights, etc. And then here comes Frederick Douglass, a perfect example of someone that just needed a chance and, right, he rolled with it. Uh, and so, We'll get into him a little bit later um, throughout um, um, our lectures, but fascinating story, Frederick Douglass. Uh, property rights. Um, if you can imagine yourself um, as an African American and you have just been freed, you have been given your emancipation by the Union Army and troops and soldiers, and you no longer have to be tied to the plantation itself. Uh, what are some of the first things you're going to do? Try to find your family and rebuild the family unit, which we discussed. But also on top of that, land and property. Perhaps one of the biggest things that um, has plagued the community uh, since its uh, beginnings, um, even up to the modern day. And so land ownership was something that was difficult for them to get. Uh, in many instances, you know, some former slaves were arguing that their blood, sweat, and tears went into uh, these various pieces of land and they were owed recompensation for slavery and to achieve this land however wherever in society there is a tilt towards either conf uh, conservative or uh, liberal mindset there's always kind of a backlash right to balance the scales and so the southern whites started to call upon white freedom saying it is our birthright to live on this land and have these plantations and so we will defend it to our dying breath and so uh, they did not want to share in any of the land uh, and all of the uh, titles right? that came with it. Uh, and so many African Americans found themselves uh, disenfranchised when it came to land, and we'll get into some of that soon. Uh, but conversely to white freedom, 
African Americans also had their conception of freedom too. Uh, but to them, it was an open-ended process because when you do not have the current status of freedom and you want to you know, achieve a hopeful one day idealistic version of being free in the society, uh, they knew that it was an uphill battle. And so they wanted to transform their lives in society and the culture and everything else um, to the best of their abilities, but it was definitely going to be an uphill battle. But there were some commonalities between the whites and the blacks, right? And their search for commonalities, uh, excuse me, their search for freedom. Uh, they both wanted self-ownership of themselves and of their land. They wanted family stability. Um, they wanted religious liberty, political participation, and economic autonomy. Um, and although religious liberty was not that big of an issue, or uh, family stability or self-ownership, the political participation and the economic autonomy was something that the whites in the South could not stomach. And those were things that they could control. And so as we're going to be seeing, uh, not only in this lecture, but especially in our future lectures involving Jim Crow and the segregation years, uh, we're going to see that Southern legislatures would uh, slowly but surely enact policies uh, to not give African Americans the uh, higher paying or managerial jobs, uh, try to uh, block them from higher education, not give them voting rights, um, keep them at the bottom end of the sort of uh, capitalistic, right, hierarchical pyramid, if you will. And so this is going to be a constant fight and battle. Uh, the Southern economy in the post-Civil War uh, so the Civil War saw approximately 260 plus thousand Southern men die for the Confederacy, more than one fifth of their male population. Uh, and so, you know, and some estimates are even more, right? Because our estimates uh, range depending on any new historical data that we get uh, and better census data. But, you know, many, uh, much of the South was just ruined, right? Farmland work animals, industrial buildings, railroads, right, you name it. Um, because this is war, right? The North's objective to win the war was to destroy the South and vice versa. The South's objective, uh, although not necessarily to just destroy the North, but you get it, right? It's warfare, one, one uh, side versus the other. And so economic devastation took hold. The South was uh, absolutely just ransacked. It was destroyed. People were feeling down on themselves. Um, their property values tanked, their railroads were destroyed, whatever few industrial buildings they did have, because traditionally the South was an agriculturally based economy, they were ransacked and destroyed as well. And so white planters had to now engage in manual field labor again, since all of their workers just left and they were emancipated and freed. Uh, and so many were starting to lose their life savings because they had invested in the Confederacy. They invested in the Confederate bonds and the promise that the Confederacy will rise and uh, be strong. But all of that money and investment was now worthless because they lost the war. And so as you can imagine, many whites were feeling uh, pretty disheartened during this time. Uh, and as the whites are feeling disheartened in the South, as you might imagine, they are starting to get pretty testy and uh, in many instances, aggressive against African Americans. Uh, beatings, lynchings, hangings, uh, intimidation, uh, you name it, right? Court disputes, land disputes. And so, like I said before, the union, the federal government is trying to enact a top-down approach. When you legislate things from the top, right, from the federal level, and hopefully it trickles downwards. It's a forceful way to have uh, change within the country. And so they did as much as they could by enacting and creating the Freedmen's Bureau. Now, this was an agency created by Congress uh, in 65 to attempt to uh, help this, the social fabric in the South. Uh, it was led by O.O. Howard, a graduate of Bowdoin College and Civil War veteran. Uh, and uh, some of their key responsibilities were 
to establish schools throughout the area because illiteracy was so high in the African-American population because they were slaves, right? There was no need to educate them. Um, the Southern white uh, plantation owners actually had a much uh, needed benefit to keeping them illiterate. Um, and so also to provide aid and poor to the elderly and settle, most importantly probably, settle disputes between whites and blacks uh, to secure as much as they could legal treatment for all. Now, some notable success that they had was in education. By 69, only a few years later, they built nearly 3,000 schools and served more than 150,000 students. That was an enormous accomplishment. And um, the Freedmen's Bureau, in general, because they were there to keep the peace, right, and keep each other from slitting each other's throats, um, the main thing that the Freedmen's Bureau were known for was to be peace keepers. If you remember anything from the slide, remember that they are peacekeepers. And so, you know, as O.O. Howard is discussing all of this with General Sherman, when you write, we talked about General Sherman uh, marching through the South and winning the Civil War alongside of um, General Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, Sherman said to Howard, it is not in your power to fulfill one tenth of the expectations of those who framed the Bureau. I fear you have Hercules' task. If any of you are ancient Greek fans, uh, take History 140 if I'm ever teaching it again. But if anyone is an ancient Greece uh, or Greek mytholo mythological fan, uh, Hercules famously had his 12 tasks, his 12 labors, and uh, they were each one, right? Nearly kind of impossible. And so, you know, kind of that is a nice little nod and testament to just how monumental of a job um, O.O. Howard and the Freedmen's Bureau, the peacekeepers, had. Now, these uh, various videos that I put here of the links, um, I'm not going to play them during this lecture because, uh, honestly, I don't know if the YouTube algorithm is going to have a field day with that, um, but because I don't want to go through an hour and a half or whatever of lecture and then suddenly it's like, oh, YouTube flagged this. So um, in your own time, please go through the slides and play these videos for yourself um, just to get a little bit more of an idea of the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, the first couple of videos are more informational. They're around, I think, eight minutes long, something like that, uh, describing the sheer amount of violence in the South that was going on, uh, how the Freedmen's Bureau were creating schools, but also more importantly, whenever there were disagreements between a white and a black, uh, let's say, landowner. Uh, let's say if the white owner, and this would happen on many occasions, uh, would lie, and not honor their contractual agreement with the black uh, farmer, uh, he typically would say, well, just go through the courts, right? I, I, can, I have more money than you. By the time anything happens in the courts, I'm gonna bankrupt you. Um, and so the Freedmen's Bureau will come in and take the side of, uh, let's say, uh, whoever was right, let's say in many instances in those cases, it was the African-Americans that they were correct in their allegations. And so the Freedmen's Bureau, the, the Freedmen agents had the federal authority to act as a, um, a legal authority. And so right then and there, they can make the official judgment. Uh, and so those first two videos kind of detail some of those uh, moments in time. The third video has Mr. Matthew McConaughey. All right, all right, all right. Uh, and uh, it's from one of his uh, newer videos, uh, or newer uh, movies, I should say. And although it's not supposed to represent exactly the Freedmen's Bureau, um, it's pretty darn close. And so he and a few of his white posse uh, are escorting um, a group of African Americans that are in the South marching towards a voting poll. And so once they get to the voting poll, uh, the man inside kind of just says, uh, sorry, we don't have them Republican tickets for you, right? Um, and then they have a little bit of a standoff and essentially Matthew McConaughey and everyone else says, these men are here to vote. Uh, you better give them the right to vote. Uh, and so they right, put in their votes. And so it's, you know, it's a very tense moment in the South, as you could imagine, right? And so this uh, photograph depicts the, uh, one of the many Freedmen Bureau schools, how they uh, spread education to more than 3,000 schools in the South during a four or five year period. And one interesting thing to note here is the age group. Uh, men, women, young and old, everyone is represented here just because once you are emancipated, 
uh, from the bonds of slavery. It did not matter if you were five years old or 50 or 70. Uh, if you were illiterate and you wanted to learn how to read, you were going to go to the local school. And knowledge is power, and being literate is the first step in that uh, endeavor, especially politically. Um, and this representation is great because it shows the freedmen acting as a peacekeeper against violence, right? One of the tenets that they were supposed to embody. And so uh, here we can see that, uh, you know, he is trying to keep the white and black farmers from slitting each other's throats, literally, right? They have daggers out, they have guns. Uh, and so he is trying to prevent violence to the best of his ability. Uh, this uh, this newspaper slash magazine article is very interesting because as African Americans are freed, uh, we start to see uh, an a growing intense in the South's campaign against uh, the community, the African American community, and so they start to say that right like the the way that the african-american gentleman here is portrayed right that the negro is lazy he is idle um, and he is just using congress and the federal government to get what he wants and so this is a very uh, calculated measured approach by many in the south uh, to portray all of this as a you know a terrible devastation that has happened in the united states it's like dear god what have we done we gave them freedom we gave them rights What's going to happen? And so, like, this whole kind of campaign, right, just really starts against this. Uh, and so much, so much evidence. Uh, land reform. So, remember, we were speaking about land. As soon as you are freed from your bondage, you have to make sure your family is okay and safe. And then you have to try to figure out um, how much land you can acquire for yourself. So, uh, as African Americans understood that land redistribution was not going to take place effectively, um, what was the end result? The end result was that many of the white owned plantations were now at a loss for labor. And many of these African Americans were now at a loss for housing and food and shelter. So an agreement was struck, not a great agreement, but an agreement nonetheless. Two different um, early uh, systems were put in place right for land reforms um, each you know meaning to help both sides right and so the first one was sharecropping uh, where a tenant farmer on cultivated land gave part of their crop as rent and so you are essentially just renting the land uh, the white plantation owner would still own the land own the plantation and the materials and goods but uh, you could have a portion of that land, say 10%, 15% of that land, right, whatever you have to yourself to toil and work on that land. But at the end of the harvest and the years, you had to allocate a certain percentage of your crops and your money as rent. The problem with this is that many of these um, allotted spots of land were not large enough. And so because they were not large enough, whenever they would have uh, the yield at the end of the year, right, with all of the crops, um, or the cash crops or whatever they were growing, um, it would not be enough to pay the rent and to make a profit for themselves. Um, especially when you consider that many of them needed uh, to purchase, and sometimes on credit, uh, to purchase all of the tools that they needed to start farming. Because they had no tools and it's not like the white plantation owners are going to say, oh, here's all of the tools. I, you know, I wish you and I bid thee um, good prosperity and harvests. Ha ha. Right. Um, so they had to purchase all of the goods themselves um, on credit. And so many of them found themselves going more deeper and deeper and deeper into debt, unfortunately. Uh, we also had crop liens. Crop liens was where the process of obtaining loans uh, and credit from merchants on other uh, big, larger farmer uh, farming chains um, was taking hold. Now, this was for both African-Americans and poor white farmers. Um, and in essence, crop liens was you had no money at all and you bought everything on loans and credit. And if anybody knows uh, what it's like to deal with banks and loan sharks, it is not a pleasant experience, even today, right? Um, they will repo your entire life, take away your car, take away your house, take your iPhone, take your kids, maybe not your kids, but they'll, you know, they'll take everything from you to pay off your debts. 
And so um, these were very extremely high interest rates. Um, and they led to uh, cotton prices plummeting um, as well. Uh, the the debts themselves did not lead to cotton prices uh, plummeting, but I need to elaborate on that a little more. So once uh, for a crop lien, you have no money to your name and they give you money as a loan, but it's very high interest rates. So it's very difficult to pay it off and usually they would not make enough money to pay it off. So you went further and further and further into debt. Um, the problem was that at this time, Cotton prices fell, but why did they fall? Uh, because wasn't the whole system of slavery based on cotton and tobacco production in the agricultural South, right? You'll think, oh, well, there's plenty of money. But the thing is, because the United States was out of the cotton game for a few years fighting the Civil War, uh, and the U.S. was exporting approximately, uh, it was uh, anywhere from one third to one half of the world's cotton at that time it was a huge amount of money uh, but because they were out of the game for a few years worrying about the civil war the rest of the world uh, had cotton shortages and so they were forced to actually produce more of their own cotton especially uh, huge superstars like india right they just upped in the production of cotton and so by the time people in the u.s got back into cotton production heavily the prices were just low there's plenty of supply globally already uh, so that didn't help uh, African Americans or poor white farmers. And so many of these farmers soon found themselves in incredible amounts of perpetual debt, unfortunately. Presidential Reconstruction under Andrew Johnson. Aha. So let's get into the main man, the main cheese himself, Andrew Johnson. He was vice, uh, vice president to Lincoln. And as we said uh, before... Uh, once Lincoln was unfortunately assassinated, uh, Andrew Johnson was elevated into the presidency. And <laughs> he was elevated into the presidency at the very beginning of Reconstruction. And so he had the immense power to dictate how Reconstruction was going to unfold and what direction it was going to abide by, right? And so he was a Southern-born man. He was a Southerner. That was just how it was. Uh, and so he had the unique ability to um, be nice towards um, his fellow Southerners in a time when, uh, theoretically, he should have tried to uplift the African-American community even more than he did so. But he had an interesting story himself. Uh, his wife taught him to read uh, during his Taylor apprenticeship when he was young. Uh, later on, he rose through the political ranks he was in the House of the Representatives, and then he became a governor, and then worked his way up to a senator. Uh, so, you know, he kind of clawed his way up to the vice presidency, uh, kind of like a House of Cards-esque type of way, I suppose. Um, but he did not have Lincoln's diplomatic skills and his negotiating uh, skills. Lincoln was very f uh, famous for being a charismatic uh, lawyer. He was an attorney. And uh, he was so intelligent, he could have intellectual arguments and debates for hours on end, right? He was a political, you know, intellectual machine. Uh, Johnson was a bit more on the stubborn side. Uh, Johnson was uh, very stubborn. He did not take criticism well at all. And he ended up uh, kind of just pushing people away. Uh, and so it ended up happening that he still held on to a lot of his deeply racist views uh, from the get-go and believed that many African Americans had no role to play in Reconstruction at all. Uh, and Johnson's program um, was enacted, the Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction. Uh, and so once the war ended... Uh, and they needed to start the whole reconstruction process. He immediately offered uh, a full pardon to all white Southerners who took a vote, uh, or not a vote, excuse me, who took an oath of allegiance to the Union. Now, this is a very loose and lax requirement because it's very easy just to raise your hand and say, oh, I swear uh, I'm loyal to the Union, and then that's it. There's there's nothing put on the line. There's no liens on your house or liens on your property. There's there's like no repercussion for potentially not abiding by any of this, right? You just put your hand up and swear, but that's it. So that's essentially what ended up happening. And uh, 
you know, this proclamation of amnesty originally excluded the Confederate leaders and the wealthy planters uh, because the Union soldiers and the military wanted, obviously, the Confederate uh, generals and the leaders to be held accountable. But even later on, he pardoned them as well. And so for those who wanted to see some type of justice in terms of seeing the Confederate generals or the leaders hang uh, for uh, treason, right, uh, they never got that satisfaction. Um, he even appointed governors who called white-only elections. And the fact that the southern governors were a the southern states were able to elect their own governors uh and of course they were electing only white governors meant that the power status the power quo status in the south would remain the same and that their loyalty would be only to whites not the new and upcoming black communities that were uh thriving in the south or trying to thrive and so ultimately the south uh had some type of autonomy to rebuild itself not under the supervision of the Union and Lincoln's, uh, you know, vision of the future of white and black mixing together in a harmonious, peaceful way. But now the South is being autonomous and rebuilding itself into this new age form of uh, racism. Um, but just, you know, keeping within the power structure at B. And so the main conclusion I have here is that racist Southern leaders were still in power and that for decades after this, uh, African Americans were suffering greatly. Because after this, we started getting the Jim Crow laws. We started getting segregation. And then all of these fights leading up to the civil rights era with MLK. And even then, things did not clear up. And we're still having riots and protests today, right? Uh, so at this stage, this is probably where things should have been forcibly patched up from a top down perspective. And having the military probably come in and just force equality to the best of their ability and just get it done. But the fact that uh, this wound, instead of being sewn up, was just kind of patched over with a loose band-aid. Uh, the wound ended up uh, remaining, festering, and now up to today of the modern U.S. has just become uh, this immense scar that seems that it will never go away. But hopefully one day it will. Uh, here we have Andrew Johnson and how he was portrayed. On the left-hand side, this is a wonderful uh, uh, viewpoint uh, that some had about uh, Johnson um, and his reconstruction. So on the upper left-hand corner, there's rioting. Uh, there's Lincoln's uh, chapel, right, that's on fire. African Americans are pleading for their lives. Um, and, you know, so Southern soldiers are coming in and kind of, you know, mopping up these uh, uh, stragglers, right? Um, on the right, they are fighting and killing African Americans as well um, and kind of getting the job done. Um, there is a, a letter, or not even a letter, um, a kind of post on the left-hand side. It says, pardon to rebels. Uh, and so this is a critique on uh, Johnson because he gave a pardon to all of the rebels, the traitors of the day and age who fought against the nation itself. And you might be asking, why in the heck is Johnson wearing a uh, tutu and this kind of like Shakespearean uh, costume? Well, that's because he is fashioned after Iago, the main villain of Shakespeare's Othello. Uh, and so, you know, he, Iago, the villain of Othello, uh, you know, always says good, sweet, honeycombed words to the person at B, but secretly has his evil agenda. And so this is kind of like a visual representation of a Union soldier, a black Union soldier who is, uh, uh, you know, he has a, his arm is in a sling, so he's injured. He fought for his country. He's injured. And if you can tell in his papers, he has um, honorable discharge right and a grant so he fought for the the union he fought for his country right he's honorably being discharged but johnson is kind of whispering sweet things into his ear and saying oh well i will help the african-american community of course i will but of course him being iago from othello it's all a lie so i love this imagery that we have the black codes uh from 65 to 66 um and onwards but especially during this a year or two, 
uh, we start to see that laws are passed in the southern states to restrict African American freedom and to compel them to work in a labor economy based on low wages or debt. So remember all of the crop liens and sharecropping uh, ideas that we were uh, discussing right from a few slides ago. Uh, black codes were essentially uh, the, that type of uh, train of thought on steroids. And so th throughout the South, they wanted to keep um, you know, African Americans uh, low on the socioeconomic level. And so because on a federal constitutional level, African Americans are emancipated, they can no longer be slaves. Okay, fine. But the whites, they tried to find a way around that by having like legal loopholes here and there, right on the state level. Uh, and so they attempted to convert the age old slave based agricultural economy that they had during slavery into a free market economy right which they had to do slavery was abolished um, and some rights that were granted to African Americans were they could have marriage legally they could own property and they had limited access to the uh, court systems and so you know they gave a few concessive uh, concession uh, laws and rights because the Constitution and the federal government were demanding it however um, each state like I said found loopholes and so the rights were, that were denied to African Americans were they could not testify against whites in courts, they could not serve on juries or state militia, and there was no voting. And so they were also often uh, forced to sign yearly labor contracts to one uh, employer, and if arrest and arrested if they refused or they broke that contract. And so what many of these white plantation owners would do, if let's say you signed a crop lien agreement with them or a sharecropping agreement what have you they would act so viciously against you and with such malice and with such content and uh, despicable lies that it would force you just to stop you know the agreement with them and break the contract but they would then say aha you broke the contract and so off to jail with you and so it was a vicious kind of infused uh, system right that tried to maintain the status quo and the North's reaction to all of this, because the North was the territory of Abraham Lincoln, the territory of the Republicans, of the Union that fought against slavery. The North's reaction was that no one assumed Reconstruction would happen overnight. They thought it was obviously going to take some time to heal the nation. But the North was at, you know, absolutely shocked at how blatantly horrible the South was treating the African-American population. And, you know... Uh, how white supremacy was still alive and well in the South. And so whatever their good intentions were, it was not being utilized to its full extent. And here we have, here we have a wonderful representation uh, visually of the, uh, <laughs> the White League, right, or uh, Southern Whites, uh, shaking hands and being in conjunction with the KKK uh, and so let us not forget that the Democrats of the South because the South used to be all Democrats uh, they used to be in league and cahoots with the Ku Klux Klan um, and here visually we see that they are shaking hands and bartering an agreement that is covered in skull and bones and that the people who suffer are this African-American family the man the wife and their child um, the schoolhouse is burned down uh, and in the back behind the behind the wife there is an individual lynched and hanging from a tree and so all of this visual representation is just uh, perfect represent perfectly representing uh, the time period and up up top where the eagle is it says this is a white man's government and so uh, definitely uh, something to look at um, and even today, you can go through and find some wonderful primary sources on things such as the black laws, right, within Illinois and other um, states. And so you can read some of these horrendous laws that they enacted. And we're going to go through some of them right now. Uh, in Louisiana, for instance, they were they were terrible when it came to black codes. And so uh, my apologies if anyone gets offended by me uh, pronouncing some of these uh, words, but you know, I feel that, you know, it is um, part of the historical narrative. So 
it is you know worth to dive into some of this um, to educate future generations. And so um, the first one states, any Negro found drunk within the said parish shall pay a fine of five dollars, or in default thereof work five days on the public road, or suffer corporal punishment as hereinafter provided. So anyone who's found drunk, uh, because you know. At this day and age, everyone is uh, pounding a few, right? If you want to have a couple whiskeys and they get a little drunk. But no white man had any laws against him getting a little tipsy and drunk on the on the roads. But God forbid if, you know, uh, if a black man uh, had the same type of interaction, uh, he had a, either had to pay a fine or sent to jail or sometimes corporal punishment, which meant uh, whippings, lashings, or worse. Uh, second, no Negro who is not in the military service shall be allowed to carry firearms or any kind of weapons. Doesn't the Second Amendment state that you have the rights to um, uh, to carry weapons and a gun, right, for your self-defense? And so they wanted to strip any firearms from them so that they could not fight back against these type of laws. Number three, no Negro shall be permitted to preach, exhort, or otherwise declaim to congregations of colored people. Essentially, they tried to gut their... Uh, you know, congregation religiously towards the churches. Because remember, church and religious ceremonies and institutions was, uh, you know, part of one of the main kind of, uh, you know, uh, building blocks of the African-American community as soon as slavery was released. So uh, the fact that they are targeting them not having weapons, targeting the fact that they do not want them joining and meeting up in these churches and congregations shows you that it is systematically trying to disenfranchise these people and strip away their power and their rights. No Negro shall be permitted to rent or keep a house within said parish. Uh, this is gentrification at its finest. Um, there's a lot of documentaries, obviously, now in modern day uh, cities such as Chicago, Los Angeles, um, of gentrification happening and various governmental citywide policies of, of certain colored uh, folks or immigrants um, not being allowed in various communities and only kind of having a whites only type of communities uh, in terms of what real estate agents want to sell. But here it specifically said, you shall not be permitted to rent or keep a house within this said parish. So very clearly they want to have this black side and this white side as far as uh, regional territory and real estate goes. What, violators of these laws were subject to fines, whipping, branding, jail, etc. Now we all know what a fine is. You pay money. Whipping is you take a whip and you harshly, you know, crack it across the skin. And so your skin ends up having this terrible gash and the, the wound just splits open. Uh, and then the blood just starts flowing down. So if anyone ever whips another human being, uh, 10, 15, 20 lashes, at a certain point, the amount of blood loss is so great that you die on the pole, right? So whipping is terrible. It's just a terrible, gruesome death. Branding. If anyone has ever worked on a cattle ranch before, branding is when you take your emblem, whatever it is, you stick it in the fire till it's red hot and the emblem is red hot and scorching and then you pierce it into the person's flesh until it sizzles and boils and then you take it off, forever marking them. Uh, and of course, jail is jail. So as you can see, these codes were meant to subjugate and subdue a certain... Uh, a certain category of the population and keep the status quo. Uh, the modern day relevance to this, we have voter suppression laws, ID laws, and a general lack of civic participation amongst African American and Latino voters. Um, it is slowly changing because people are finding out that they must vote and enact their civic duties, otherwise positive, meaningful change is not going to happen in this country. But we still see in various parts of the nation and with Tre President Trump, uh, with his recent tweets in regards to Michigan's voting, not wanting mail-in ballots and Georgia's voting and etc., that the they are perfectly happy to not have as much political participation on this side because they know that Trump's base is going to win out in the end. And so that's a very ingenious slash insidious uh, political strategy on behalf of the Republican Party. But if they continue on like this, most likely the chances are going to be that Donald Trump would probably 
also won the 2020 election versus Joe Biden. If most people are unable to exercise their voting rights. Speaking of voting rights, the origins of the civil rights. Uh, so moderate Republicans were, um, you know, believed that Johnson's uh, reconstruction plans were flawed and that they desired to modify the situation. Uh, in 66, we had Mr. Senator Trumbull propose two bills on the floor. Number one, to extend the Freedmen's Bureau, right? The, the peacekeepers that we saw not too long ago. And number two, the original Civil Rights Bill. And there was a few iterations of the Civil Rights Bill, but the most famous being the uh, 1963 uh, Civil Rights uh, Act, right? Under MLK and the entire movement. But in 1866 here, we had one of the first earlier ones. And so this defined all persons born in the U.S. as citizens, regardless of race. And each and every one of them would have equality before the law. And states could no longer implement any legislation to, detri to deprive these people of their rights to contracts, lawsuits, or equal protections. And so Johnson immediately vetoed this bill because he feared that individual states would not, especially in the South, would not uh, be able to live up to their usual lifestyles. Um, and because he is a Southerner himself, had his own racist agendas, um, he vetoed it. However, Congress still pushed it through and made it law in 1866. Two years later, we got the 14th Amendment, which defined citizenship for all persons born in the U.S., granting them privileges and equal protections as well. Uh, and so we ended up getting, uh, you know, it ingrained in the Constitution as an amendment. And although this is pretty much the same thing, the Civil Rights Bill and the 14th Amendment, a bill is much easier to overrule and overtake by later congressional parties um, than an amendment. So to change and alter an amendment is a much more strict and hefty process. And so the fact that they had at, at this day and age, because Congress had the momentum to go f through with it. They ended up choosing to make it an amendment um, and so to thereby consolidate uh, you know, their viewpoints on all of this. Uh, speaking of the 14th Amendment, uh, the US Supreme Court in its uh, decision just to f uh, around 10 years or nine years before um, forbid black citizenship. So before the Civil War started, this US Supreme Court themselves forbid black citizenship. And so radical Republicans were seeking some type of constitutional amendment um, to ingrain some type of change. So this, so the Civil War gave them the excuse uh, and they had enough backing in the, on the congressional level to finally do so. And so um, the 14th Amendment states that all people born in the U.S. are going to be citizens. And this 14th Amendment um, overturned a very important and long-held decision under Dred Scott, the Dred, famous Dred Scott decision versus Sanford. Uh, interesting uh, tidbit of history, the Dred Scott versus Sanford case. The individual was not named Sanford. He was named Sanford without a D. But the Supreme Court justices were too lazy to fix it later on, and so it still remains a Sanford. <laughs> but um, it was a 57 decision where the U.S. court held that the Constitution of the U.S. was not meant to include uh, African American citizenship, and so this was, uh, you know, this was a kind of monumental decision where the U.S. Supreme Court was going against the um, the public rhetoric at the time, and so the uh, three fifths compromise was uh, eliminated uh, due to this. Uh, and so the three-fifths compromise used to be the solution where every three out of five slaves were figured into population for consensus and for Congress seats, etc. Uh, but that's a little more on History 117, early U.S. history side, so we won't get into that too much. But essentially, both Democrats, Republicans are kind of throwing their uh, political punches, right? And they are trying to enact their legislation. Radical Reconstruction, 67 to 77, right? A longer period of time than Presidential Reconstruction. Presidential Reconstruction lasted like two years. This one lasted around 10 years. And so in 67, we had the Reconstruction Act. And so 
Uh, Congress temporarily divided the South into five military districts, wanting for new state governments with black men up at the helm and also at the bottom to be given the rights to vote. So the North was seeing what the South was doing, and they saw what President Johnson was doing to the African Americans of the South. And so they literally just fought a war and had hundreds of thousands of people die. And so this was fresh on everybody's minds. And so people were not going to just sit back and take this. And so President Johnson himself was put on trial before the Senate for high crimes and misdemeanors, essentially for being a traitor and sabotaging the Reconstruction. He was one vote shy of conviction. He was so close. Uh, this is a direct parallel to the very recent uh, Donald Trump uh, you know, court hearings, right, and um, his uh, time in front of, you know, uh, the chopping block as far as Congress goes, wanting to kick him out of the presidency. Uh, and so Donald Trump was also, what, one, it was either, what, one or two, something like two votes shy of, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, kicked out of office. And so as much as people say that, you know, oh, modernly today, the U.S. is as worse as it's ever been politically. That's not necessarily true. The U.S. has always had a tumultuous experience politically. Uh, it always just feels the worst during your generation because you're living it. We're living it right now. Uh, and so once Johnson's term ended, a new president had to come into the fold. And so Ulysses S. Grant came into the fold because he was the Union's most prominent military hero. Uh, he was he alongside with General Sherman were the two generals that pushed on into the South and ended up winning the Civil War. He is the one who sat down with uh, General Robert E. Lee and signed the um, papers, right, that the Confederacy was to surrender. And um, you know, this is also the day and age where if you had extensive military experience, that people loved to see that, right? If you were a veteran, if you had military experience, you were uh, having huge points right as far as the people were concerned uh, and so he won the presidential election in a good margin and following his uh, victory congress in unison with grant wanted to pass the 15th amendment prohibiting the federal and state governments from denying any citizen the right to vote because of race and that's the important part because of race and so on on the face of this amendment it is very good because it wants to, you know, get rid of racism and allow everybody to vote. However, now that the southern states have no other choices, they're going to find sneaky ways to go around this. And so the 15th Amendment states, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race color, or previous condition of servitude. And so the pro of this was it's one step closer to racial equality in America. And it's still a constant battle today, but it's one step closer. The cons were that the southern states were now attempting to restrict voting based on non-racial reasons. So if I can't discriminate you to vote just because you're black, well then. Let, let me come up with other reasons. Um, let me give you a literacy test to see if you can read and understand uh, what you're voting on. Let me give you property qualifications. You must own X amount of property in order to be able to vote in some states. And so our entire discussions of property qualifications, crop liens, sharecropping, ownership of land comes back right now. Poll taxes. If you want to vote, you got to pay a tax. But if you're struggling with money and you're trying to build your family and put food on the table, you know, why are you going to uh, pay for a poll tax? You're just going to save that money for food and other necessary items and things that you need. Um, this video that we have with Ulysses S. Grant uh, is a great one. It's the last days of Mr. Grant, of President Grant. And it details his, uh, him writing his own, you know, biography and detailing his life. And showing that even towards the later end of his life, he was uh, suffering from cancer, right? He was really struggling with life. 
um, and needing to kind of ingest essentially cocaine water in order to have the pain go down. But um, towards his end of his life, uh, he just started to write so much, so much biographical stuff. Uh, you know, in his biographical work, he detailed that he never thought as a young boy that he would become such a prominent figure in U.S. history, such as the President of the United States. So it is a bit ironic and interesting that years later, his figure and face would be on the $50 bill forever immortalized as one of the greatest presidents of U.S. history. Uh, so if you have some time, like 10 minutes, 12 minutes long, watch the video. It's pretty good. Uh, here is a representation within one of the magazines of the Johnson impeachment hearings, where he was one vote shy from conviction. And yet another one of President Johnson being put, um, uh, you know, across the uh, the senators and all of the legal team trying to impeach him for wrongdoing. Here is uh, President Ulysses S. Grant on the right-hand side, very uh, rugged, very studly, um, you know, in his uniform. And on the left-hand side, finally being elevated to the President of the United States, donning on the, uh, the crisp white shirts and the ties and the tuxedos and uh, the three-piece suit. Um, and so, arguably one of the most impactful U.S. presidents, and thank God we had him directly after Johnson because he took as much of the chaos during presidential uh, reconstruction, those two years under Johnson, and he switched it over towards radical reconstruction um, and allied himself with Congress and tried to undo as much of Johnson's work as possible for the greater good. Um, and so thankfully, much of their work was immortalized in the amendments and cannot be easily taken out. 15th Amendment here, kind of detailing um, all of the uh, you know, various uh, liberties, right, associated with, uh, you know, the freeing of African Americans and gaining the right uh, to be equal and uh, vote, etc. And so all of these kind of photos in all of the various corners of this image uh, truly kind of speak to that. And the bottom left hand corner, the school, that's the Freedmen's School, right, the Freedmen's Bureau. And so things are coming directly into fruition here. Uh, we also have the Constitution of the National Women's Suffrage Association. Uh, so during this point in time, um, the 15th Amendment was geared towards all males, but unfortunately did not guarantee females the same amount of suffrage and voting rights. Um, and so... Many wanted to extend the right to vote in all states, especially the Western territories, um, and some provided more incentives in the Western halves than others. And so we have all these various articles of the Women's Suffrage Association wanting, um, you know, all of these changes to be made. Um, but unfortunately, it would take them many years until the suffrage would occur in the 20th century. Um, African American office holders. This is an important one. Uh, because as African Americans are gaining the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, getting educated, literate, etc., uh, they start to understand one crucial thing. That on top of voting, we need to get our own guys into political office to make meaningful change. And so they start to, alongside with the Republicans, uh, voting a great number of them into public office, approximately over 2,000 African Americans into public offices throughout the South, especially. And so African Americans now have the opportunity to voice their concerns, voice their um, discontent towards what is happening. And they are making a real difference in Southern life. Um, and they, you know, they accused, uh, you know, many of unfair trials, of unfair taxation, etc. And they were attempting to change that, right, actively as much as possible. And so, it's amazing to see how they started to really target and tackle the political system and um, the unfair uh, hierarchical system at B. Um, they wanted to change it from the inside out. If you've ever heard of the, 
you know the the um, the term. Uh, you have to get them from you know you have to be within the belly of the beast to make some type of change. That's essentially what they tried to do. Uh, carpetbaggers and scallywags. Uh, carpetbaggers has kind of been lost to the echoes of history, but scallywags are still somewhere in there. Um, especially if you're watching, I don't know, some old episode of SpongeBob, um, and there's some type of pirate figure in there, and they're saying "Ah, you scallywag" or something like that. But let's kind of look at the two differentiating terms here, shall we? Uh, carpetbaggers were northerners who settled in the South after the Civil War for one reason or another to reap the benefits of Southern office positions and advantages. And so many within the South, the poor disenfranchised whites that found themselves at the l losing end of the Confederacy and the Civil War uh, saw a bunch of these northerners coming in to you know, take these southern offices and positions and change their way of life. They saw them as the enemies. They saw them as carpetbaggers. The reason they saw them as carpetbaggers because sometimes, you know, they were bringing their actual carpets with them, right? These long form carpets they put over their shoulders and kind of carry them into uh, office or into their new homes. Um, and so they they call them carpetbaggers. Um, scallywags is perhaps a worse uh, term to call someone because. This was a term reserved for white Southerners who collaborated with Northern Republicans during Reconstruction, often for profit. And so the Southerners saw their own fellow white Southerners working with the Northerners uh, against their own advantage. And so they saw them as the traitors, the enemies. Like, how dare you work with the Northerners, right? They're the enemy. Um, so, so much for Reconstruction, I guess. The KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. We are uh, due Sunday. We have our video, right, of Daryl Davis, the 19-minute video um, that is related to the KKK. So definitely end up watching that, please, and answering the various questions. It is a great TED Talk. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan is a 20th century secret fraternal group, mostly and all of American-born white Christians advocating white supremacy. And they started to initiate terrorist tactics to instill fear into various enemy groups. And so they were the military arm of the Democratic Party in the South. Now, I know some of my students always ask me, they're like, wait, Professor, aren't the Democrats on the side of African Americans today? Right? And they're like liberal. Uh, the parties ended up switching uh, during the civil rights movement in the 1960s. So after the 1960s, our modern conception of Republicans and Democrats stayed almost the same. Slight differences here and there and evolutions, but almost the same. Before 1960, the Democrats were the party of the South, of the um, Bible Belt, and the right arm of the KKK. The Republicans were the party of California, of the North, of Lincoln, of anti-slavery. And so... Once the 1960s would roll around with Martin Luther King Jr., the Civil Rights Era movement, those two parties ended up switching allegiances and sides because of the Civil Rights Act, this monumental act under, um, uh, under the 60s, right? And so as the Democrats unleashed the KKK throughout the South, uh, essentially acting as you know, a terrorist group, an organization to intimidate uh, whites and blacks that were working against the Southerners. Um, the Enforcement Acts were made in 1870 to 71. And so Congress adopted these to outlaw terrorist societies and allowing the president, President Grant, to use the army against the KKK and other domestic terrorist organizations. So Grant ended up dispatching federal marshals backed by troops to various areas and arrested some Klansmen. After a few well-published trials, they went out of the public eye for a few decades. And so for a little while, it seemed as though the Republicans and President Grant snuffed out the KKK. Uh, in modern news, uh, I believe it was Trump who recently tweeted that, and the far left uh, organization Antifa, right, the anti-fascists or a movement, uh, is to, he wants to at least, label them a terrorist organization. And so this type of rhetoric is nothing new, uh, but it's definitely interesting to see how it compares to this day and age 
uh, and the various consequences in between. If you have time, please watch this video detailing the KKK. Here, the I Am Committee, right, and the Harper's Weekly, uh, showing, uh, you know, various, uh, you know, actual legislations and uh, from the Harper's Weekly uh, during the reconstructed state, the colored rule, it says. And so, remember I said that the South was enacting, uh, that the South was enacting vigorous campaigns against uh, African Americans gaining the right to vote and gaining, uh, you know, equality under the law. Uh, here we can see that this is the colored rule. What would happen if African Americans actually had a legitimate shot at ruling within Congress? And so it is shown as them being uh, ugly, dim-witted, fighting all the time. Uh, there's the white guy in the corner, right, kind of having his hands up. It's like, I'm not doing anything. Uh, and then Lady Liberty, right, with let us have peace, right, with the olive branches of peace, just kind of like standing over there. Uh, and so the whole scene and imagery essentially says if we allow these African Americans into political office, they're just going to run it into the ground. And so the this campaign system keeps on happening over and over again, right? Uh, on the left-hand side here, we have a traditional cross-burning. If you want to see more of that, um, go to uh, Daryl Davis's uh, video that is due on Sunday. On the right, we have the traditional garment of the KKK member, right? The hooded robe in white, the U.S. flag in conjunction with the Confederate flag, um, a traditional sword um, underneath, a Bible, and of course a rope noose in the back because you never know once you need to lynch and hang someone uh, and so this group was definitely um, I guess objectively categorized uh, and thought of as a domestic terrorist organization because they used intimidation and fear tactics against all who opposed them and the scary part is is because they were hooded while they were performing these atrocities so during the day they could be very nice people. They could be your mailman. They could be the school teacher. They could be um, the cook at the favorite restaurant that you're in. And they're very nice to you. But even if you're African American, they'll be like, oh, hi, sir. Let me help you with that. Uh, and then at night, they would put on the cloak and the robe, and then they would come to your house and kill you and your wife and your daughters, right? And make you as an example in the community. So these are very scary times. Um, and we've seen the KKK resurge on a few various in instances. Um, recently, in the last few years, remember Charlottesville? In Charlottesville, we had the uh, huge rallies and the white boys with the tiki torches. Looks very, like, weirdly reminiscent to this. Um, and so, yeah, there might be, uh, you know, this new, pu new pushback, especially with Donald Trump at the helm. Definitely a pushback. And so the end of Reconstruction, we get to the Civil Rights Act of 75 and my final thoughts. So the Civil Rights Act of 75 outlawed racial discrimination in public places like hotels and theaters. Um, but economic recession in the mid 1870s prevented Northern Republicans from divor diverting more resources and care into the South and enforcing um, equality. So the results were that the southern states enjoyed more freedom in implementing their own agenda and legislative rules. So in, in essence, the southern states were um, allowed to maintain these, you know, many times racist agendas of theirs. And so my final thoughts, although Reconstruction was meant to unify the nation, it only scratched the surface and did not do the job that it was intended to do. It left the gaping festering wound in the united in the united states open um and even today the scars are deep and very difficult to get out uh and we can see that even today in the modern day and age just from a couple of weeks ago with all of the black lives matter movements and the conversations against police brutality and inequality in this country and so even though reconstruction was meant as something good intentioned and definitely was hard fought for because of the civil war 
Um, unfortunately, many of the things that were supposed to happen during Reconstruction, f forcibly or not, uh, they did not end up, you know, actually coming to fruition. And so with that, the end of chapter 16. <laughs> we finally made it. Uh, the end of chapter 16, uh, the end of the Reconstruction uh, chapter. Uh, the next chapter after this will be chapter 17 or Westward Expansion. We're going to be looking towards uh, and analyzing the various immigrant groups coming to the United States, um, all of the eastern coast uh, cities and populations moving westward, and um, how that interacts with uh, Native Americans, uh, the various Oregon trails, population movements, uh, the Spanish-American War, excuse me, no, uh, uh, the uh, Mexican-American War, taking over of all of the land in the West, um, and all of that. Uh, so thank you so much for being here, for listening to Chapter 16 and Reconstruction. Hopefully you had a good time. Definitely go back through the slides if you can and watch those few videos. It'll give you a little bit of additional context. Um, and they're each like eight minutes long. Some are three, four, ten minutes long. They're, they're on the shorter side. So it'll definitely give you a little more perspective on that. But thank you for being here for Chapter 16, uh, Reconstruction. And uh, I will see you for Chapter 17.